Spotlight. I'm the host, Julio Martinez, and we're sitting here in this very small flat somewhere in Manhattan, as realized on stage, a road machine located right here in Los Angeles on Pico Boulevard. We're going to be talking about a Los Angeles premiere play. It's a three-character play, and I would just love to introduce you to the cast. By the way, the name of the play is Dying City by Christopher Shin, as directed by Michael Peretian, and the three-character cast is sitting right here. Hi. Hi. No, I didn't lie to you. It is three-character. It is. Can you explain the discrepancy? Um, yes. Uh, uh, I'm Bert Grinstead, and I play both Peter and Craig, who are identical twins. Uh, couldn't be more different, but they're also identical twins, so they couldn't be more similar. So it's a, Ooh. yeah, it's, a, it's a, a weird task, and it's very hard, but I, uh, I have a great time doing it. And Laurie Oaken? I'm Laurie Oaken, yes, and I can speak to the, from really day one, they were two different people, and clearly in his mind and in my mind, and it actually was, like, I feel like I've been working with two different people, in a sense. And it works that way for the audience, too, I know. We hope so. I was sitting here opening night. Oh, good. Now, I have a kind of a back history with the play, because I interviewed your director, Marco Perezia, who was seeing this play in New York. Yes. And what he said to me when I interviewed him, he said, this play does not exist in the line. The lines do not communicate the play. The play happens in between the lines. Now, if a director comes to you and you're about to go into rehearsal, I would find that a bit for a Well, uh, you know, as an actor, you're always looking for subtext anyway. And, you know, when you read a script like this, that is evident on the first read. And I, I don't know about you, I'll speak for myself, but it made me so excited because like, you don't see very many plays that trust an audience that much that, and trust actors that much. Yeah. He's got also very little stage direction in the play. And it, you, know, you just feel like this is such an opportunity to really do what we're trained to try and do rather than try to make things sound natural that don't really need to be said. So this is a reversal of that, which I found very refreshing. I thought it was very interesting. When I first read the play, you know, it's about 85 pages of, of two people talking. And you're, and you're reading it the whole time like, this is two people talking. How is the audience going to enjoy that? But whilst you're reading it, you're getting everything from these characters. And it's a, a beautiful piece if you read between the lines. You know? yeah. It's poetry between the lines. It's pretty great. I found myself asking some questions in my head as I was watching it, like, who had the hard part learning your lines, Peter or Craig? <laughs> Peter, definitely. <laughs> Peter had an impossible time. His, you know, he's all over the place with his lines. His speech patterns are deaf. Uh, they're, just... they're very natural, very yeah. natural in the sense that, you know, the way we're talking now, it's, it's just a flow of mind, and it's, it's beautifully written in that sense, but it's also impossible to memorize. <laughs> because it goes in a million different directions and you really have to find his train of thought throughout the whole thing. And then Craig, Craig is just a very straightforward... Well, he's so single-minded. Exactly. Well, I, Until I would, he's not. Yeah, I would just agree. I mean, he's single-minded in the way he presents himself. So, uh, this great abode we're sitting in, uh, this is the apartment of your character. Yes, this is Kelly's apartment, what was Kelly and Craig's apartment up until a year prior to the action of the play. And Craig has gone off to Afghanistan. Iraq. Iraq, Iraq. excuse me. That's right. And Peter, you're a very successful actor. I am? Well, well yes. All right. And very handsome, it's evidently. Funny that you're, 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 you're referring to me as Peter, but then you yeah, probably that, refer to me as Craig as well. You know, uh, uh, yes, Peter is very. Well, if I refer to you, Craig, I expect a complete. Yes, exactly. Change of... <laughs> totally different response. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, Peter is a very successful actor. He he works quite a bit, and he just recently came to his fame as an actor. And the reason he is here partially is because he is doing a play. Yes. Yes. A play. That I would think would practically kill you, which is Long Day's Journey into Night. Yes. The, the Peter's playing the older brother. You no, know, no, the younger Ben. Oh, plays a yeah, uh, uh, and he's you know it's a it's a pretty intense role in itself, uh, which is a role I'd love to play to all those producers out there. 
<laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's a great role, and it, and you can tell that he is very much affected by the way the the character is is taking him in his stage life along with his real life. Now the basis of the action for this play is that Peter has arrived unannounced. The reason he's arrived unannounced is your character has made yourself incommunicado. Yes, the last time we spoke was at the funeral of Craig, which is a year prior, and he has since written me a letter that I did not respond to. For all those viewers that have not seen the play, Craig dies in Iraq, so that's why there was a funeral. Yes. <laughs> Under suspicious circumstances. Under suspicious, suspicious circumstances, yes. Suspicious. Suspicious circumstances. circumstances. So, uh, so yes, and, and Peter has tried to reach out to Kelly, uh, which includes in part him accepting this play in New York. Like, that part of his reason for doing the long day's journey into night was to be in the same city and try to reestablish contact with his brother's wife. And uh, I have made that impossible, and so he has no recourse but to show up at my door because he's that desperate to find answers about what happened to Craig. And also with both characters, both of you have agendas that you're not communicating at the beginning. Uh, Peter's invaded you in the process of your agenda, agenda, and he has something that is not comfortable for him to say about himself. And all of this is happening, well, a lot of other things are happening all at the same time. Uh, at one point, I was listening to Peter rattling off, and the fascinating right, right. thing was just watching your character's face through it all. You could see all, all the wheels turning and changing direction. And There's a real push-pull with Kelly because she's, like, she's worked really hard to get to a place where she's separating herself from this life, um, from this person, and yet... He's in her apartment in clear need, and she's a therapist, and her nature is to empathize and to be sort of drawn in. And so there is sort of that constant struggle. Was there a lot of discussion of the characters during the rehearsals? Did you do backstories? Yes, sort of. Um, we kind of left the backstories up to our our own selves. Uh, we didn't really discuss that as much. And it's very much written, the backstories. Uh, they come out in very subtle ways throughout the play. Uh, but yeah, I think the um, throughout the rehearsal process, we had a, a pretty extensive rehearsal process where we really discussed our characters' relationships to each other and, and within each moment of, of the piece. It's the kind of play where you really can't work on the sort of micro cosm that it is, each of these little moments are so directly related to not only who these people are, but where they're at with each other in that moment, in that scene, because there are so many dynamics that are constantly shifting. So even to figure out a five-line moment could take us an hour and a half. <laughs> there is very easy to read into your facial expressions, like Try to write the play that's going on in your mind. I'm Italian, so <laughs> very expressive. Do are you doing an interior dialogue? That's what it looks yeah. like. You know, love to know what that is. She's a good actress. <laughs> <laughs> there's and, a lot that Peter says that I mean, then there's lots of little things that he says and does that, you know, in the middle of something else going on, for example, he puts down his, his cup of tea on my television and I have a little mini moment of, oh, help yourself, I only have posters everywhere, but whatever. <laughs> you know, there's, that's what the play is full of, like these little sort of fill-in things about the relationship. Does it change from performance to performance? Yes, I would say. Would you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not absolutely. too much. <laughs> absolutely, because, you know, it, but, um, uh, as we've talked, you know, Peter is, is very much, he, he kind of rattles on and, and says a lot of things, but, and every night sometimes I place something in a different moment and, and do something a, a little bit different, and, it, and I think that really changes her reaction to it, certainly. It's a big surprise, because we don't expect it, and the ethic of how it's set up. Uh, there's always a reason for Peter or Craig to leave the room. But when he comes back, a different character. And 
the, the neediness of Peter is certainly offset by the combativeness of, of Craig. And in your character changes because you're responding to Peter's need and you're battling Craig sort of toe to toe at times. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of dramatically shocking to watch. And it must be interesting to do. Yeah, I mean, I would not, it would not be clear to the audience that I'm two different people without Lori's reaction to, to how I, when I come into the room as a different character. Uh, because she treats me totally different as, as both characters. And it's incredible to be a part of. Well, it's not hard to do because when he comes in, like you can see instantly, uh, you, this is a different, like I said, from day one, it, it, stop it's different for you to stop it. <laughs> Well, one of the interesting things about Craig is uh, he walks very assertively with the size of the room. Like, you feel that he could go right through a wall. Uh, because generally people gear their steps towards the space they're in. Craig doesn't. He's like he's still totally outside and about to charge somebody. Uh, so even, even within the containment of the dialogue, when you're supposedly having a civil conversation. And did you come in with Craig right for the moment, or did you discover him in process? Uh, well, part of the audition process for this play was to come in with two very intense scenes from the play uh, as both characters and, and prepare those two. So that, and immediately I knew the two difference, the difference between the two characters was that this this, you know, Peter is, is a very weak, but also very passive aggressive about his, his personality and his comments and things like that. Whereas Craig is a very strong presence and, and he has to be strong, otherwise it can't work. And that's something that I've always struggled with on stage uh, because, you know, being in front of people, it's a very nerve wracking experience. So you have to, you know, kind of feign this confidence, but at the same time with with the way the dialogue is written for Craig, it's very easy to kind of strut your stuff. And also, you know, uh, I pull very much from my father who, who, you know, will walk into a room and command the room without even doing anything. You just the way he stands and the way he, he... So the physicalities, I think, were very, very natural for me to come up with. Uh, beyond that, it was all discovering through the rehearsal process. And for Kelly, the reactions to both people are so dead on that it seems like uh, you're two different people. <laughs> well, they, it's it not only two different relationships, but two different time. Like what happened between a year ago and now to this person was something that I really had to figure out. Um, you know, she's, there's a lot that's been lost for her beyond just her husband. There's her confidence, you know, like... She's a therapist, and yet this thing was going on under her nose that she didn't see, and and all the other stuff that happened. So, yeah, there's a there's a there's a difference there. By the way, we're talking about the play *Dying City* by Christopher Shin. It had its New York premiere a few years ago, seen by Michael Peretzian, who just had to do the play in Los Angeles. And he had a bit of an in because at the time he also happened to be. Uh, Christopher Shin's literary agent. He has since retired from the literary business and gone on to do what he really wants to do, which is direct great work, which this certainly is. And to show you a bit of it, I'm going to ask you guys to do a part of a scene. Can you set it up for us? This scene is the uh, third scene of the play. Um, it happens after Cre uh, Peter has entered the apartment and kind of made himself comfortable here. Uh, and then he exits to make a phone call and comes back on, or Craig enters on, and you find a little backstory between Craig and Kelly within that moment. And then Peter comes back to find Kelly relaxing on the couch watching some Law and Order. And it's just sort of a, you know, the Peter Kelly scenes in particular are just sort of this constantly shifting. Somebody's always uh, off balance. And, and somebody's always on top, yeah. Yeah, there's a real sort of thrust and parry thing going on to what they're doing to each other. You painted. Oh, yeah. 
white. <laughs> Brighten things up. It looks good. Oh, I'm interrupting your law and order. Oh, I can watch it whenever. Tebow? Yeah, mm -hmm. I programmed it to record law and order whenever it's on. Just an endless stream. I see stream. mine rerun all the time. It's so humiliating. You're kidding. <laughs> Why have I never seen it? Skater pothead? What? No, man, I wasn't in the park that night. <laughs> Very good. Oh, please, the casting director just wanted to fuck me. I told him I couldn't skate. He said, oh, it's okay, there's not much skating. They sent me the shooting script. Of course I'm on a skateboard in every scene. I used to not like Law & Order, but then it really started to grow on me. Oh, yeah? I have this theory about it. When did you start watching all this TV? I don't remember you being a big TV person. Yeah, I never watched before. Was it after Craig died? Maybe. When I couldn't sleep, I'd watch TV, I'd watch... I had trouble sleeping. Shows. The worst time for me was actually months after, when the official report came out that said it was an accident. That's when I couldn't sleep for some reason. Yeah, the grief comes at different times. It's so unpredictable. <laughs> but I came up with this theory. Would you like to hear it? Oh, definitely. Well, I realized that all these shows, all the Law & Orders and all the rip-offs follow the same exact structure. Someone dies and a whole team of specialists springs up to figure out how to solve the mystery of the person's death. Right. Which I think is a fantasy people have. That they won't be forgotten. That their death won't just be accepted and mourned, but that an entire community will come together. All these special people Scientists and lawyers and forensics experts, doctors, judges, all these people who are devoted, who will not stop until the mystery of the death is solved and therefore symbolically reversed. Wow. <laughs> Only 56,000 episodes. This is good use of insomnia. It's, it's weird with me lately. Um, I've been sleeping fine, but then out of nowhere, like doing this play, uh, the other night I had this fantasy, this image almost, of a Black Hawk helicopter crashing through the ceiling of the theater. While you were on stage? At the curtain call? The curtain calls have always been kind of weird for me. I sort of forget who I am. Am I me, or am I the character? But lately I felt like Craig at Curtain Call, and I thought, you know, that, that makes sense. That's how I started acting. When I, when I was little, I would pretend I was him, so. so maybe it's like a delayed grief reaction, like. It may be. Tim thinks I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Keeps bugging me to go see his shrink. But I'm like, no. You know, if this is grief, these moments, then I should feel it, right? I don't want to medicate my grief away. I'm not a psychiatrist. But I think Tim is right. It does sound like you should see one. Really? You think? Huh, that surprises me. I'll think about it then. So, as I said, that was a tantalizing episode from Dying City, and I can promise you it gets a lot more intense from there. <laughs> I'm wildly curious about the, your audiences. This is a very intimate space. You're close to the audience. Do you feel varying dynamics from them, from performance to performance? Are you aware of audience reactions? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I am. I don't know if she is. <laughs> yeah, well, the only things that I really notice are when somebody's yawning or shifting. So don't do that. <laughs> but you, you do feel, I mean, one of the great things about a space this size is you feel their energy a lot more. And um, for the most part, it's, it feels incredibly supportive. It, it feels like people are really right there with us. Yeah, definitely. And in, in the pauses, you can feel attention. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And also the a beauty of Michael Peretzian was he made us, forced us to be down here in front of the couch for the majority of the play. 
and especially during those really intense moments. So we are right in your face right. about these, these moments. And we've had audiences say that they feel uncomfortable being in the same room as us. Yeah, I, I could understand that. Which yeah. is kind of a cool thing. To like that they're of. overhearing things that are too intimate yeah. for other people to hear. Well, the intimacy within it, which is part of the genius, I think, <clears throat> of Christopher Shin's writing in this, is that I've seen very few playwrights who reveal that much about a character or strip them that naked. Not literally. <laughs> Usually the director does that. <laughs> uh, and it just keeps going. So when you think that this is pretty wild, by the play's end, um, you disappeared altogether. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's the beauty of his writing is that... that um, not only is it very natural dialogue, but you also discover so much about these people and, and where they come from, who they are, and why they are where they are. It's just a, a beautiful, almost biographic, uh, you know, biographical piece about these two characters, or three characters, excuse me. And it speaks to the, with the, your question about the audience, too, that like the, the right, this play, the way we rehearse it and the way we're experiencing it, the audience is less distracting for me than they've ever been in a theater this size because it just feels like they're part of the world that we're very fully invested in. And, you know, that we're finding things every time we perform this play, we're finding new things. And it's a play that demands such presence from the actors that it's, it's, not, it's not even distracting to have people in your apartment. Usually when you have a play this intense, there's got to be, you got to give the audience a break. Do you feel there's anything within the play that was meant to, for them to laugh? You know? There, early on in particular, there are a few uh, funny moments, I think. You know, the, the first, I would say the first half of the play is much more subtext, well, and then it hits the fan, and then, then it's no holds barred. But I also uh, disagree. I think there's parts at the end that are very funny, too, but people are not in the mood to laugh anymore <laughs> which is which is kind of a cool thing but at the same time it's 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 you know feel free uh feel each moment as an audience member kelly is packing i can see the boxes over there and we have to believe her at the beginning of why she is packing uh the books and it turns out to be different have either of you ever been alone in an apartment packing to leave? Oh, yes. Absolutely. It's sad. <laughs> it's depressing, yes. <laughs> and lonely. Mm-hmm. And we do get that essence from, from your character. That's why she's drinking wine and watching Law and Order. <laughs> <laughs> Which you have TiVo'd. Yes. Yes. Have, have either of you lived in New York? Mm -hmm. Yes. We both have. Yep. Well, Not together. Oh, but, you know. no. Um, in more dire economic straits? I mean, uh, were you starving in New York? I wouldn't say starving. <laughs> I would say but certainly, being an actor in New York yeah. would kind of fit that description a little bit. There was the four or five part-time jobs going on. Yeah, oh, yes. Absolutely. There was, you know, what, struggling to get a subway ticket. What brought you to Los Angeles? You, sir. Uh, the, <laughs> the babes? Ah. No, the, the weather. I mean, I, I grew up here a little bit. And, it's the babes. Uh, and I, I missed the, I mean, New York is, while it's the most, one of the most populated cities, it's the most lonely city to be in. And out here, it's very much a community, which is great. Where are you from originally? Massachusetts. Boston? Worcester. Oh, goodness. Yeah. You've handled the accent quite well. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. both from Massachusetts, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. Where are you from? I'm from the North Shore, north of Boston. Oh, sure. She probably had a stronger accent. As soon as you said me. Boston, I got it. Yeah. Gloucester is where yes. I'm from, north of Boston. When did you come out here? Uh, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. I came out here right after, right after college. I got a job that got me my SAG card. I had, my plan had been to start in New York, but then once I got my SAG card and made some contacts in L.A., I thought, well, I should try L.A. because now's the time. And I ended up staying. Uh, I didn't actually go to New York until several years into having been here, and I just needed, you know, to kind of be out of L.A. for a little while. And my whole family's on the East Coast. So that's when I went to New York. And then so for me, it was coming back to L.A. because this is where I was able to make more of a living. And you're our... 
how does Rogue Machine work? It's not a repertory company. They audition f for each show. It's Is a membership. Right? Membership. Company, yes. Um, but they are open to casting outside of the company if there's not, you know, if there are roles that require that. Um, Have you both done other plays here? I'm not a member. Oh, the, uh, you're from yet. the outside. Yet. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I am a member of this company, but this is the first time I've ever actually been on stage here. So it's, it's really, it's a tremendously great experience for me. It's a great company. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, the people that work here, they really put their full effort into it. And it's, I mean, look at this set. Look at the, the audiences we've been getting. It's, it's just a, a fun place to be. Everything about it, starting with John Flynn's whole idea about it, is a labor of love. Oh, Everyone yeah. involved is doing it because their heart's in the right and place about theater. Yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed that uh, this place is kind of ramshackle when it comes to when performances are and the schedule, because it's sort of all over the place. We share the stage with another uh, company called Theater Theater. Right. And so they divide up the season between those two entities. And what are your performance nights? You play Saturday, Sunday, Monday, but at different times. Yes, we are actually in rep with another Rogue Machine show in the other space, so they can't go at the same time. So we're Saturdays at 5, they're Saturdays at 8, <laughs> we're Sundays at 7, they, I think, have a matinee on Sundays, and we're Mondays at 8. Mondays. So, yes. Yeah. That means you won't be able to go to the big actors' equity gala on Monday the third. Oh, oh. No. we should have written that into our contract. It's for the hundred year anniversary. Yes. Wow. And the reason equity always has events or on Monday because that's the dark night. Of course. Oh, well, yes. except well, for you for guys. Us, except yeah. for us. Yes. Um, but yeah, the other play is called One Night Miami. It's going to be a great show. Yeah, they have their first preview tonight, actually. What? Yeah. Oh, that's the one about the Muhammad Ali fight. Yes. It's, it's about, yeah, it's these four guys in a room together, Muhammad Ali being one of the characters. Yes. And your play, Living, uh, d Living, Dying City. Uh, <laughs> Very different play. Yes. yes. Was originally, now this is the other thing about Rogue Machine. You give announced dates of when plays are going to close, and a lot of times they never close. <laughs> you know, it's like the old soldier. They don't die, they just eventually fade away. But they were scheduled to close July 8th, and it looks like, and I hope they have told you, you're extending to July 29th. Yep. We're very excited so about that. So you will yeah. be around yes. for a while. We will be around. It gives people the time to come see it. The, uh, the show itself, do you find it, in terms of your performance, evolving? Is it changing? Uh, is it a different play now than it was opening night? Will it be a different play in July than it is in June? I would say it's a living, breathing play. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the, the one thing that's very true about this piece is you have to be completely present throughout the entire thing, which is also the most draining thing I've ever done on stage. Um, so being in the moment really allows it to mold from night to night. Well, you don't realize it, but we have come to the end of this interview. Just oh. about. And, but I do want to let the audience know I am the host, Julio Martinez, and my guests are Bert Grinstead, who plays two roles and gets paid for both roles, <laughs> and Laurie Oaken. And it was written by Christopher Shin, who's in New York, and Michael Peretzian, who is now a theater director of the world, since he retired as one of this country's leading literary agents. This is Theater Spotlight. I will be back again. And it's a pleasure being here at the Rogue Machine. And it seems like I recurring come back here quite often. And I'm sure will again. Thank you for joining. Thank you.